Hello, ladies and gentlemen, you're tuned into Node Mode, the podcast hosted by Depeche Node that's focused on art and culture in the NFT space. Today, we have special guest Brian Brinkman, multimedia artist and animator, the creator of the Art Blocks collection, Nimbuds, and longtime creator on hit TV shows like The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon. I bet you've heard of that one. Uh, as always, nothing in this show is financial advice. We are not financial advisors. The NFT space is insanely risky. So always do your own research. And as always, if you enjoy the content, hit the like button, smash the subscribe button, share it with your friends. It really, really helps. Without any further ado, the one and only Brian Brinkman, friend of the show, <laughs> member of the community. What's going on? Hello, hello. Thanks for having me. Thanks for kicking it up a notch with that energy. I love it. <laughs> the one thing you left out is that Brian Brinkman is perhaps like one of the best, uh, I would call him like a professional degen as a collector <laughs> as well. Like not only is he one of the great artists uh, of, uh, in the NFT space, but he's also like one of the great collectors. Uh, and he is on top of, I mean, he's on top of the long-term stuff and like the, hey, you got to trade this within 30 minutes kind of stuff. It's like, <laughs> it's pretty amazing. So we're excited to have you on the show, man. Oh, thank you for hyping me up. Um, yeah, uh, the problem is I just never sell those things I should have sold in 30 minutes. And then I ended up just holding my bags until they're completely unsellable. Sounds familiar. I do that. Uh, that's, <laughs> it's, it's just part of the, it's just part of the, like the way that we do things here in the NFT space. So I want to, I want to kick things off, uh, with, with something very straightforward and basic, which is I want, I want you to tell us what generative art is, because what, one thing that's funny is we were in, uh, I remember we were, we were like in a discord channel chatting and, and Nick was in there, you know, good old nifty Nick. And he said something that he's like, oh, but you know, a Damien Hurst or something isn't generative. I can't remember what it was. And then you came back and you were like, well, actually it kind of is. So for those, for those of us that uh, are not quite as cultured, tell us about what, <laughs> what your definition of generative art is. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, 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 the general idea of generative art is kind of, um, art based on rules and that doesn't necessarily have to be done with code but just art that has a that's like system based art is kind of what they they call it which is an artist created this art based on a system and rules and they you can create multiple within that framework and so that idea spreads from Damien Hirst like his uh, currency I would say is a generative project because he had a team of people that worked within a set of rules to create each of those unique pieces so that they all looked uniform and the same. Uh, but it also works in the same with the Kishon Nimbuds here, which is done with JavaScript, which again, there was a set of uh, variables and rules that formed the randomness within this. I like that because it a lot of people just define it as, hey, it's written by code. Um, yeah. But it, it seems like it's much broader than that, right? Like it's, it's yeah. there's, a, there's a general, it's just rules that you follow and code happens to be a great way to write rules, right? Is that kind of how you see it? Totally. I mean, I'm not going to be able to throw out specific names, but there's been plenty of artists over the last hundred years that would be considered generative artists that have work in museums across the world that are not done with computers, but they were done with systems. Um, if you go to like um, up in like Beacon, they have the the art museum there, which is just a ton of system based art, essentially, but it's all like piles of stuff on floors, you know, so it's, it can be all sorts of stuff. But I think when it comes to generative art, the space is often um, kind of confusing what it means to be generative art in a lot of different ways. Some people think of it as like randomizing traits, which is generative and technically falls into that rule. But it's not the same process of making something as like an art blocks. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of like, designing a base collectible, so to speak, a base figure and kind of changing the outfits versus creating a piece of art that is a standalone piece where you would have painted the thing or something, but instead you elected to, to generate, you know, use code to generate the pieces, correct? Yeah, that's right. So like with these, um, you know, even though this is a character-based project, Nimbuds, um, it's not like there's any predetermined traits drawn so when and by that i mean like every mouth is drawn as a line and randomized how it curves and the angles and same with all the strings every single circle that makes the cloud is generated at, at that moment to randomize a bunch of cir white circles to make the cloud shape versus like a board apes where like there's a standardized set of eyes and there's a standardized set of mouths 
Um, and so like with this, everything is just straight up JavaScript, draw this line from here to here and randomize how it curves essentially. Oh, that's super interesting. Is that the same for the mustache as well? I've got an the, offering the, on, the that, mustache on that is, mustache, uh, actually. The mustache is the, it, while it's not necessarily an asset, it is, the mustaches are all the same because it's basically an, uh, we took the SVG curves of the vector line and trans, translated that into code so that the mustache draws that perfect mustache, which actually, when we first made Nimba, <laughs> there was an issue with like, it looked different at different um, uh, zooms. But yeah, as you can see, like with the code here, it blinks, it has this box that you put it back in the box because originally Nimbus was kind of based on this idea of like kid robot toys and like uh, where you buy like a blind box toy and not know which one you're going to get. I love that. So, That's so cool. Yeah, I, I literally, I think that that mustache one, I think I have an offering on that one. I'm trying to scoop it, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm feeling the mustache these days, you know, so yeah. Uh, what, one of the weird things about Nimbuds is that when Artblock switched from their V1 website to their V2 website, it ended up jumbling a lot of the traits in, in this specifically. So if you go into one of these, there's no trait for like mustache yes or no anymore. And so really there's only three core important traits to Nimbuds in my mind is there's blue background is like, I think a third of them have that. And then I think like 20% have mustache and 20% have blush. And so in, with that logic, I think there's maybe two or three that have all three of those, but because none of those traits translate into the metadata anymore, none of the trait snipers, none of the rarity guides understand anything about <laughs> this project anymore. And so anybody that tries to buy these based on uh, like algorithmic trait rarity stuff is just totally going to buy random weird stuff because it's going to be like, this one's blink time is 15 seconds versus 10 seconds. And like, none of that really matters in my mind, at least. Yeah, that's interesting. The, uh, I, I love the way that, that like the Nimbuds are actually like, they're super unique, right? Like, you know, exactly what they are. Are, are you as an artist, I think you may have mentioned this before, but like, how do you view, uh, you know, this idea, like Pio and I have talked about this, having like a distinct art style, right? Like Nimbuds is very unique and specific. But yet, you know, if we went to some of your other work, I think we would actually recognize it. And it's mostly from what I can see, a lot of it's based on like, it's almost like color schemes that you're trying to continue through other pieces of work. How do you view this idea as an artist of like trying to be recognizable yet trying to create your own unique, you know, art in, in however way you want? Yeah. So when I joined the space, I kind of stripped away all the stuff I had been doing before, like uh, doing like pop culture art galleries out in LA where I was doing like pieces of art based on movies and posters for concerts and that kind of stuff. I kind of started fresh. And what I wanted to do when I joined the space was focus on animation and building like an, a language around my art. And so that started with the colors, which I'd had my very first super rare piece has those like kind of colors is these exploding clouds. And you can see the, that cloud lineage. A lot of what I did was I didn't want to get stuck doing the same style specifically over and over and over. Cause I always find that like creatively puts you in a box it's very handy for collectors. They prefer that because they can judge an artist by that a lot easier. But when I kind of looked at the space, I was like, there's so many mediums and so many cool things you can do here. I don't, I want to try all of it. And so I used the colors as a link that allowed me to go from 2D animation to 3D animation to neon dark room to bright color green grass and all this stuff. But as long as those colors are there, it ties it all together. And then as I did that, different iconography would start to form. So if you look at one of my early super rare pieces, uh, which is called um, Swing, or not Swing, um, Wired, that's, that's the one where you start to see these kind of wires, wired rooms, uh, which then translated into what became my Nifty Gateway drop a few months later, which was the Cloudy Collection, which then translated into becoming what Nimbuds was, which was taking that Cloudy Collection and figuring out a way to turn it into a generative project. So. I always find that like my stuff has this linkage to pass things while kind of pushing myself in different uh, mediums and directions. So we got the super rare pulled up here and I, yeah, I can see it. So like you see this piece tangled right here. I mean, there's a, a, a kind of, you know, you can see Nimbuds, right? You can see mm -hmm. where the strings that are holding the Nimbuds up come from. Yep. And that's, that's one of the new ones. So if you go back and you scroll way down towards the bottom, you'll see, you know, a, an evolution. At least that's my hope is that while I make these new weird ideas, 
they don't disconnect me from my past work. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah it's like that you're, you're kind of linking things throughout time and, and paying homage to your old, to your old stuff. So when you, when you were thinking of creating something like Nimbuds, do you, so you kind of like now reference your old works and you mm -hmm. say, Hey, how do I, how well, do that, I link this up? That one wired, I would say it was like the, the original oh, yeah. pre precursor to what became Nimbuds. Um, and so then when I got on Nifty Gateway, I, I made kind of a sequel to this where it was me because this was this came out of the beginning of COVID lockdown. I was feeling very stuck at home. That's why I'm wearing the mask. I'm stuck in VR. I'm in the metaverse. I was playing crypto boxes all the time. So this piece was me feeling kind of claustrophobic and connected to everybody in the space, but very, feeling very trapped in my lockdown house, essentially. Um, when I got my Nifty Gateway drop uh, later that year in October, I felt a little more free and relaxed. And that piece, you can see I'm like sitting on a cloud and the clouds kind of swaying back and forth while I'm kind of like dripping and feeling relaxed. And so that was kind of this, this back, you know, telling a story of my journey uh, through these visuals. And so it all, it all kind of slowly connects and builds a bigger picture using kind of different iconography and colors. Brian, your stuff's so awesome. Uh, it's so original and the animation, you know, no surprise since that's your, your trade is really, really refined. Um, who are your creative influences? Because the theme that has, you know, come up a number of times on this show is, is being original and quite frankly, what the level of importance of true originality actually is. So I don't have an animation background so, or like knowledge of the animation space. So I don't know if there's a bunch of examples of this exact animation out there and you just ripped it off. Right. <laughs> and so, and so yeah. I'm curious, like, who are your, your, your artistic and creative influences? Yeah, I mean, this one probably goes back to like the old Windsor McKay where people would do rotoscope animations back in the 1920s. Um, yeah, I would say, you know, I went to school for animation. Um, one of my early inspirations was Don Hertzfeld. Uh, if you know his work, he did something called Rejected back in the day. That was a, a wonderful stick figure animation that got nominated for an Oscar for short film. And that was like, oh, you don't have to be Disney to be a great animator. You can make really profound, funny things um, but with stick figures, essentially. That was that was eye opening to me. Um, yeah, there's the, there's the classic. Uh, my spoon is too big. Um, you got to watch the ad real quick. Yeah, you got to watch this luxury ad. Four seasons. Somebody's been going to some fancy hotels. This is the life of Pio these days. <laughs> Ever since he moved back to New York, he's like, I go to art exhibits and the Four Seasons. Dude, he's he's living it up, man. Look at yeah. that. So I mean, this was like crude, but it got nominated for an Oscar, and the first time I saw it, I cried laughing. This, you know, I was like. 17 or something and i was like this is insane because the whole concept of this is he made he made ads for companies that were rejected and they're just like absurd absurdist uh animations but then it turns into this like high high you know crazy animation that stop motion and all this stuff um so that was a huge inspiration early on i was inspired um by bill plimpton if you know his work he's a traditional or uh, an independent animator out of new york he was you know when I went to school for animation, the, the paths to success where you go work in studios or you become an independent filmmaker, um, you might have seen his stuff like, he, again, he, he made a lot of stuff that was kind of, this I think was, might have been nominated for an Oscar as well, but he does all these like colored pencil animations that are just insane stretching of animations. But he kind of, you know, he was one of those people early on that told me like, you you just need to have a core group of people that support what you do and you can make a living being an artist. You don't need to, you know, sell out per se, though he's done like Kanye West music videos and all sorts of cool stuff. Um, but like, he was like, don't go work for Disney. You can just make whatever you want. And so that was really inspiring. And he would make like feature films animated in a year. He's a, he's a really prolific dude. Um, so like, those were the kind of like, inspirations as an animator of like this is how i can make a living in animation without necessarily having the skills to be a you know pixar disney illustrator uh it's more about storytelling and using the medium to to basically tell stories about yourself in the world um and i think that then if i was to talk about like influences within the space when i joined um, i joined because i'm a collector of killer acids work i have some of his physicals um, 
when I saw him on, I saw him selling stuff on super rare. That was why I applied. Cause I was like, Oh, this is a cool platform. I don't understand what any of this means, but I want to learn. This seems like the future. Um, so he's a big influence. And then I would say, uh, John Orion young joy, huge influence in terms of like building a world of like colorful fun. Um, when I joined the space, there wasn't many people that had colorful hap, like not necessarily like, just joyful art other than joy. It was a lot of X copy. It was a lot of this Rob Ness. It was a lot of grunge grit, which skulls. isn't bad. Yeah, yeah it's not gotta, bad. It's got to have skulls. <laughs> it was a lot of Vitalik art and Ethereum symbols, which is all fine. Um, with, you know, even J Josie, who I'm a big fan of, her stuff had like, you know, gas mask. It was all very um, dark. Uh, and so when I joined the space, I kind of approached it as like, I, no one's really playing with colors much. Um, no one's really playing with animation much. And so that, that was kind of how I approached the space was I, I was like, I can play to my strengths in these and kind of have fun in this and be able to stand out against what at, at the time was a very kind of gritty, uh, art, art scene. That's so cool. And like, for example, this one, d like I could see where Bill Plimpton influence comes into this, but this, <laughs> yeah. is, but it's very original, right? This is a Brian Brinkman piece. This isn't Brian Brinkman ripping off Bill Plimpton. And I, I love that. Um, I'd be curious, like as an artist, you know, yeah. they say, they say that artists like copy other artists for a long time. And then through that process, they end up like having breakthroughs and, and developing their original style. Is there, a, is there like one occasion or one event or one time period of your life that you feel like was a breakthrough for you developing this style of yours? I mean, just to give you an example, I went to the Basquiat exhibition that's being put on in Manhattan, which if anyone's in New York uh, while this thing is running and you, you appreciate art at all, you got to go to it. It's by his estate and there's 200 plus works. And they start with the stuff that he did as a kid. Then they go to the stuff that he did in high school. And then you just go into a room with like yeah. 50 of his crazy paintings. His art style is identical from when he was a small child drawing Captain America cartoons to when he was doing 16 foot canvases. So I'd just be curious, like when your style was developed. That's a good question. I mean, my, my style developed while I was in college, but then I think a year or two after I was in college, I went out to LA to work on a cartoon called Life and Times of Tim. And I was roommates with a guy who worked for Adventure Time. And so I spent a lot of time hanging out with like the Adventure Time crew and people that eventually went on to be the Rick and Morty crew. And nice. did a lot of like drink and draw events. And I feel like there was like, that was an influential and all those people were like able to kind of create this kind of goofy fun style uh, that was like fun, fun to draw. Not like if you look at like how they draw, like the Venture Time arms, there's no bone structure. It's all just kind of gooey fun. Like, I think that was pretty influential in terms of like, oh, I don't have to stay on model all the time. That's an animation term, but I don't have to make things like, physically make sense. You can just play around with motion and it, it's pretty fun. Um, so I think, you know, those, those are definitely influences. I would say like, even you were looking at my super rare stuff. Like when I joined, I, I didn't know what my style was going to be. I was still developing it. Some of those early pieces don't really look exactly like the stuff I make now at all. Um, but it was like, you know, trying to like play around with ideas like this one was just like, I guess you could say it has some of my colors, but it's not really the same colors I use now but it's playing with that animation and talking about the space. Um, but then it wasn't until maybe like three months in that I started to feel more comfortable with what was connecting with other people. But even then, whenever I found something that like, like this one was like, I wanted to try and like play around with 3d more and you can see the connection there with the cloud kind of, again, you can go back and look at a lot of the stuff and see where it's like thing, the icons were starting to build. Yeah, it feels like it It always has to be kind of just this organic thing. Like you just keep getting your reps in, right? Like PO always likes to talk about that when it comes to creating content. And it, and the same thing for art, right? Like you're just continually producing. And then over time, organically, like you, you find your, it's like finding your yeah. voice, right? Finding your yeah. artistic style. Like this one is probably the closest to my pre-NFT um, art. Because I used to make 
these gallery pieces that would be shadow boxes where I would paint them animation cell style and build these like three dimensional shadow boxes with depth and do them in animation style. And you can see that here, especially with like uh, the drop shadows and the, the layers to it. So, you know, that was probably the closest I got to like bringing that style back into this. Yeah, that looks so cool. By the way, we got to we got to give a shout out to the commenters here. One of them says you look like an improved version of Haley Joel Osment. So that's, a, that's, a, that's a great. Uh, I think that's a great compliment, dude. I love it. Great. He's awesome. Yeah, there it is. And then the next person says, like, yeah, he sees dead people. You know, it's yeah. like a, all the time. <laughs> all the time. There totally. it is. <laughs> yeah, but like I think you you showed that dancing guy that piece specifically. You can see a a direct connection between. Um, I think it was down a little bit, but uh, the one that Sarah Zucker owns, um, that the one on the left there, the dance, the dancing fellow, that style inverted became what my neon pieces are on Nifty Gateway, essentially. So oh, yeah, that's awesome. We're gonna pull those up now. Go ahead, Node. Yeah, I was gonna ask, like, so now nowadays, uh, do you find yourself hanging out with? uh a lot of generative artists or animators uh or both like where who do you end up like I, I imagine there is like this there's probably like this illuminati right of all the gen artists that have been on ab curated and they're all like the you know the ogs this is what i'm thinking of in my head give me a little bit of like insight into into the world of generative artists like what's the culture like what do you guys uh, talk about i think i think you have to type my name in the top there there's been this issue with the search recently where it doesn't uh, no, right in that search collection, uh, right there. Yeah, I think if you type Brinkman there, it'll work. I, I, I ran it. If you scroll down, they have a more. It's all very. Look at uh, all that. They're, they're working. Oh, they're. Go. I know. I know they're working right now on like organizing this better. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I'm in DMs with a lot of different types of artists. Um, I would say all the all the art blocks people. There is a channel in the art blocks Discord for the curated artists that everyone hangs out in. Um, Oh, that's I cool. don't I don't hang in there too often, but it's fun to go in and congratulate people after a drop. Um, and then I'm in a lot of DMs with Nifty Gateway artists and people from like For the TL, which is Max Kolchinsky's like collective of artists. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I just kind of hang around in a whole lot of different groups. I don't think there's one specifically. There's a lot of photographers in New York that like to get together. The Dave Krugman and All Ships kind of crew. I see those folks pretty often. Um, but yeah, I don't think it's like, it, to me, it, everyone's kind of working in the same way. So it doesn't really matter like what their medium is because we're all, the medium is just one aspect of the space and the rest of it is like connecting with other people and marketing and all this other stuff. And we all share the same uh, challenges in that sense. That's awesome. So speaking of art blocks, like uh, how do you view it? I mean, it's changed a lot since you launched your project, right? <laughs> like <laughs> I feel like you like the this the the irony of the whole thing is like you were so early that I like had you been 6 months later, like you might have been able to add another zero to what you made. Like which is just <laughs> wild, right? Just the timing of it. Um but like what do you see as the future of art blocks uh it, kind of moving forward? Um yeah, no, I I think it's been fun to watch because I, it clicked very quickly for me when I first saw it. Um, and what, like, how do I say it? this? What is possible with it keeps expanding in ways I know I don't expect. And I'm always surprised by, cause you know, we did it in basic JavaScript and what has like, once you started to see like geometry runners and like people doing like 3d, then it was like, I didn't even know that was even possible like to do on chain and stuff like that. So it's been cool to see how different artists approach it and bring in different styles. Um, yeah, it definitely, it's been a roller coaster in terms of the value of the market cap on that project. Cause every a year ago, everyone kind of lost their minds cause three AC and a bunch of people kind of spent a huge chunk of money on it. <laughs> but uh, I think it's interesting to see like where it's going like the the more art that comes out the more it feels like museum quality art like that that piece by maddie right there is just beautiful like that's something you could definitely see at the moma you know it's it's just interesting to like see what people do with it like this project i think is doing pretty well i find typography art blocks don't always do so hot which is kind of funny because it's such an 
interesting way of using generative art. Same with uh, Asamika, which I think is a beautiful project that's like typography based. Um, it's a, I find that like there's, there's different types of collectors and most people are searching for their fidenza. It's like searching for the fountain of youth of like, <laughs> will this be the next thing? <laughs> and, and, and like, it doesn't like it, it, it makes people turn a blind eye to what people are doing because it doesn't fit the narrative that's been shaped. Uh, unfortunately, like some of these things are just incredible and no one really gives it much thought because they, they want flow fields and retro colors and, you know, this uh, one's cool. It, is this is this a curated project? I I must have completely missed this one. Mm -hmm, yeah, wow, that yeah, like this one's it, it is unique. It's interesting. I like that it's, one. It's bold. Um, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's like I. It's certain. It's it's interesting to see because like a lot of these things kind of homogenize and start to feel the same once you see a whole bunch of them, and so it's like archetype. Like that one to me is like that's. I, I wish I owned one of those. It's so beautiful. Um, it was always out of my price range. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. But like, it's so bold and the colors are so great. Like, I think what it comes down to is with this and Fidenza and Ringers, the color choices are so important to where the value is held. And you start to see projects come out that have maybe like a bit muddier of colors and they just don't do as well. People want like really poppy, nice colors. Do you think that we see these on like 16 by 16 foot like canvases or prints at the MoMA someday? I think so. Yeah, Bullish. I think so. I mean, I mean, look at Decca. The whole the whole website's built around this artist's work now. He's he's a, he's not going anywhere anytime soon. Yeah, I like that. Um Okay, I want to I want to ask you about, about a couple of current events uh, while we've got you because there's one there are two that are very interesting, right? So we've got Ox T Joe, if that's mm -hmm. how you say his name, uh, and for those that aren't aware, he's selling a piece called Blue B L E U, mm -hmm. and it's literally the color blue, and it's uh, it's awesome. But can you give us some context here? Because isn't the isn't the lowest bid right now? Like uh, I want to say it's like. You know, is it still on auction? Let's see here. It, yeah, he, he actually did something really interesting with that auction, which was he made it like a week-long super rare auction. Yeah, um, so the current bid is 69.42 ETH, by the way, which is yeah. amazing. Yeah, so the context is he's been around in the space for a while. He has a very developed style, and he's got some really high-end collectors that kind of validated him. Um and he recently did a nifty gateway drop that went crazy um, and really like validated him even more. And so he's in this position now where he's, he's like almost approaching like a Grant Yoon level of like hotness uh, in the space. Uh, and so what he did with this piece was playing into the same thing Grant did, which was uh, making it CC zero and then offering it up for collaborations and so as and and then purposely structuring this auction to be a week long that allowed an the maximum amount of um cc0 remixes to help drive more attention to it and that has continued to fuel more and more bids and so it's been interesting to watch because it, he basically he made a piece so simple that it works as a background or a texture essentially and does and, and allows uh, it's almost a, 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 a canvas to play with as opposed to you know an x copy cco or even like it's, it's very similar to grant Yoon's cow piece where the canvas is so empty it, it allows for easy remixes yeah that's interesting it's like it, it's almost like the uh the memification of it is what is driving you know the higher price and driving kind of the, mom the momentum it it, it it i mean it kind of reminds me of just like and it also has that uh just the fact that it's just a blue canvas like mm -hmm. with a with some great texture i think it looks it's a great looking background uh that like that that also tends to make people mad which also is good you know for polarity and, <laughs> yeah. and for marketing and yeah. all of that yeah it's not the it's not the first um you know blue painting to come around you could look at like rothko or a, a, um the, the eaves um but i think what he did was he marketed it really effectively in terms of getting other artists in the space 
to be a part of it because then he got uplifted by this community that's already been supporting him for a long time. And that validates him to all these outsider collectors that might not have heard of him until recently. Yeah, for sure. Pio, I threw that in the, in the chat there so you can pull it up just so I wanted people to see it so they can visualize what we're talking about. It's pretty great. The one thing that I love is that there's other artists, right? So like, uh, Kath Samard, like superimposed like that blue color uh, onto her Hawaii photo and you know so the whole thing is just the hue of blue yeah it's on the the left there Pio, the top left uh you're right I uh, sorry down a little bit it's just that first piece in the collection that's it right there so like uh a lot of artists now they're like putting their artwork and using this as the background right or they're just putting this and putting an entire shade over like K Dean, for example, right? Like we've had him on the show. He put his profile picture in this in this blue texture color for a while, and it's just yeah. kind of fun. And it's like that that kind of thing is interesting. And uh, yeah, I'm curious to see where this ends up because there's a day left, and it's almost you know there's a chance it goes up to you know a hundred ETH floor or something. I don't know. Yeah, I mean that it's become such a part of the space for the moment that it's really driving. Um, I really liked, uh, I think Jake Fre Freed or Fried, Jake Freed uh, imposed it over his like moon piece. I thought it looked beautiful. Um, but yeah, I think it, it plays into the strength of it not being intrusive. It's just a canvas. It's, it's essentially an asset that people can use. It's pretty amazing that he's found a way to brand himself with this color. You know what I mean? <laughs> and and <laughs> yeah. even just using it, you know, B-L-E-U, right? So a lot of people are just, they're using the word, they're using the yep. color it's genius. I mean, it's a genius branding thing. It's, it's super cool. Uh, yeah, we'll see where that leads. Okay. Yeah. So there's one, yeah, there's his, one his other, work is awesome. yeah, there's, there's one other, uh, current event that I want to talk about as well in the art space, which is, uh, ACK, uh, mm -hmm. our, our guy, Alpha Centauri kid. Um, he, he released, uh, what was the name of that piece? It was called, uh, uh like a color study. It's like pale blue or something. Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. It's got, and it's a piece of, uh, I threw it in the uh, in the chat view on the top. It's this color study of ACK, and he's it's it's an it's like probably my favorite piece of his. But from what I understand, this was did he airdrop this to some of his one of one holders? Is that how it started? I don't I don't know the full story. I'm I'm still trying to piece it together. I think he had Pete he had one of one pieces that were up for sale. That if you bought it and burned it, he would turn it into an open edition. And so a collector did that uh, like a day or two ago, um, bought it for, I think, 200 and something ETH, burned it, and then kickstarted this uh, open edition sale, which if, you know, the math might check out that he might raise almost the same amount of money that was burned with this sale. That is crazy. Okay, so <laughs> it, he, why? Why would somebody, why would somebody do this? Like, I'm trying to understand why a collector, I mean, basically would throw away 200 ETH. Uh, this is, know. it's like genius marketing uh, for yeah. ACK. He like, owns five or six other ACK pieces. It should be mentioned. Mm. Oh, he does. Okay. So that's a big deal. So he, maybe he's like, he's just trying to spread the meme and the culture. That is an OG collector, man. That is, an, that is amazing. And these are, I think they're 0.069 ETH open edition. And last mm -hmm. I checked, there was like, you know, <laughs> Pixelmon. Yeah. 3, when, when, when I open my thing, uh, Pixelmon comes up. If I recall correctly, this is the gentleman right here. We went through his wallet yesterday that burned the, <laughs> yeah. the ACK. Oh, you did. Okay. okay. Oh, yeah. So yeah, he's not, is, he's not hurting. <laughs> I mean, look at this. The X copy bag is like, it redefines the word elite. It's so oh, sick. Oh, gosh. Look at that. Yeah. And then here's the ACK bag right here. Mm, he's got yeah. a couple of them listed. He's got a couple of the ACKs listed, but he's got these other bangers. Here's one he bought for 69.69, uh, one but he bought for 15. And then if you look at the rest of the bag, 974 total NFTs in the bag, he's got you know some decent stuff in there, you know? <laughs> yeah. Just starting off with punks. And I think he's um, I think he's giving away some of the open editions on his Twitter that I saw a little bit ago. So if anybody's wants to not pay 0.6 you might be able to win one on his twitter um and there's an there's actually two open editions got dropped by relatively big artists in the past day um oh we lost po oh no um we'll have to survive without him <laughs> um uh tommy wilson uh former baseball player and nifty gateway super rare artist 
Um, he put out a uh, open edition as well that was filled with CCO artwork. Um, and I think that was 0 0.01 ETH. And so um, him and ACK, I think are both a part of like that tungsten DAO group and it's both kind of pro CCO and stuff like that. And so uh, it's interesting to see both of them kind of go about open editions at the same time, but slightly different uh, ways of thinking about it. Yeah. What are, what are your thoughts in general with open editions? Because I, I want to, you know, like I, I have a hard time as a collector being like, well, like I am in it for the art. I do love the art, but I also don't want, you know, if, when there's no exclusivity whatsoever, um, it makes it really hard and challenging to make sure that that it, that it at least holds its value. That's yeah. but that's only my my side of things. How do you view it? It's a good question. So far, I've not done it. Um, I I don't know the best time to do it. I think it's it's a smart move if you want to expand your collector base. But at this point, I've put out a lot of pieces, and I have a pretty large collector base, so. I, I worry at this point, if I did it, I'd be diluting. It's very handy for an artist that has only done like one of ones and very small additions to then expand at that point. Um, but I also, you know, I, I do lots of very, like I did a drop with genies a couple weeks ago or months ago that was like wearables that were free. And I think there was like thousands of them that were, that were claimed, but it's like that lives in a different value set. And I think what we saw with like, X copy is that people struggle to understand the difference of value between pieces, especially in high and high edition supply. Um, and uh, sometimes I worry that like it's on the artist to distinguish where the value should lie between their pieces uh, effectively. Cause otherwise you find certain people might buy a piece that they think is going to hold value in a way that just doesn't compared to like a, a low edition X copy or something like that. So, uh, you know, I think it's, there's definitely examples of open editions working. There's a lot of examples of them not working. I think uh, the best example I can think of is Dead Ringers because he did it for a charity entirely, which makes yep. it so that there's no stress to care about the value of it. Um, and I think it's probably holding up its value. I mean, 0.02, that's not bad. I, I, it was it was like, well, I don't remember how much. I it think cost. it was almost exactly that or 0.01 to mint. And I minted yeah. it. And here's what I loved about Dead Ringers actually was like, yeah, I knew it was all going to charity. So I was like, hey, it's super cheap. And I love the piece. And mm -hmm. I know it's all going to go to charity, which is great. So it's going to support a good cause. And this was also a fun piece of performance art, right? Like this was the final step in his Dead Ringers kind of saga, if you know mm -hmm. the whole story behind that. So that's cool. And then he came out and said, hey, if you want a printed signed edition, you can buy that for like a thousand bucks. So mm -hmm. I did that. And so I was like, I've got a, a limited edition that's printed and signed. And it's hanging up in my living room and it's like the one of the centerpieces in there uh, yeah. and i love it because it's like oh i own i own this piece but i also have a little bit of exclusivity uh because of the printed signed version that's a limited edition signed version um yeah. which i thought was really cool and one other thing i'll just mention is i like the way that you like framed it when we were talking about you know max Payne a little while ago you mentioned uh like it's 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 useful to think of it in terms of market cap not just what's the price of it, right? So the Max Payne market cap, isn't it like 10 million or something like that? Oh, looking, I got, looking good. I'm, I'm, I'm GVG too. No, look I'm at kidding. that guy. Look at that guy, dude. You got all the X copy you need, dude. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I think we were talking about, yeah, Max Payne, I love that piece. I think it's an excellent piece. So sick, uh, yeah. I would love, I don't own it because I, when it came out, I saw how many people were minting it. And I was like, that is way too many people. And I look at, you know, some of these as well. I think the problem is when an artist isn't doing it for charity, then they're hit with the inevitable, what are you going to do with it? You're going to do a burn mechanic. And then you're, as an artist, you're stuck, you know, thinking about the past instead of focusing on the next step. You're, you're worried about fixing the, the supply and demand, unfortunately. Um, and so that's why I, you know, I think if I was to do an open edition, I would do it either for charity or I would do it with a cap to it. Like I, I did one on Nifty Gateway earlier this summer that was the, like in essence, an open edition where it was first come first serve, anybody can get it. It was for collectors only, but there was a maximum cap to it so that I knew it wasn't gonna run away from me and become something that was like completely unruly. But if it went below, that would have been fine too. Yeah, no, I like that. 
All right. One of my last questions is what are you, what are your thoughts on, uh, other, other blockchains? Have you done any work on any, any other platforms yet or any other networks <laughs> besides, uh, ETH? Yeah, actually I've, I've done a lot of them. Um, uh, a year and a half ago, I was a part of the first polygon PFP project called art Vitars, which no one remembers. Um, and then I was a part of the first immutable X project, which was collective which is what that, that beast mode was from. Uh, me and X copy were a part of that project. Oh, cool. um, I've done a drop on flow. They had a, a really cool platform called Versus where you could put up a piece and let the buyers decide if it was an addition of 10 or a one of one. And whoever was willing to pay more collectively or singularly would get whichever one they wanted. Um, I, I love that mechanic. Yeah, um, that's cool. And then... Um, I was supposed to do a drop on Solana. I don't know if it's going to happen at this point. Oh, uh, no. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, it's in um, limbo as the company I was going to do it with is uh, in flux. Um, but, um, yeah, what other chains are there? Uh, I haven't I, done... The only one left I, is I, Tezos I, that you haven't I, mentioned. I, so. I, I, <laughs> I love Tezos. Uh, I, I collect a lot on there, but I haven't minted yeah. on there yet. Um, FX hash is tempting. Um, objects tempting. I just don't know what, where, like what kind of work fits there for me. At one point I was thinking it would be fun to put like the sketches for my Ethereum pieces on there as like mm. supplementary material. Yeah. Another yeah. idea was that I made a fake account and I just tried different styles on Tezos to have fun. Um, but like, I've always struggled with the worry that everything there is devalued from ETH and I didn't think it was be I didn't think it'd be fair to my collectors to like devalue myself to appeal to a different group of collectors in that way. So it's, it's something I've, I've wrestled with. I remember when it first came out, I had calls with Tezos. And I was like, how, how do I go about this in a way that's fair? And they're like, I don't know. <laughs> so it's, it's tempting. But uh, I think some artists like Sarah Zucker, X copy, they've put out very few small edition pieces on there at a high cost that, is equal to the Ethereum. And I think that might be the way to do it, but that also destroys the whole purpose of it, which is I like to go to Tezos to collect cheap art. Yeah, that's tough. Like th this question always fascinates me because I love, like I, I, a lot of people, you know, they, they, they put me in the box of an ETH maxi and I'm like, well, no, I, I just, I care about my NFTs like existing, you know, in the long run. Like yeah. that's what I, that's what I want. I want security and I want it to, to last. Right. And yeah. so that's my only concern when it comes to other chains. And it's like, you know, I, Solana's here to stay. Tezos is one that I'm like starting to wonder about, you know, only because like when you look at the volume on Tezos compared to Solana or Ethereum, it is so, so, so low. And I don't know what else is going on with that chain. Like, I don't know what else is happening there. So like they're, there's a world where, where a lot of these other blockchains like literally, you know, disappear. And that, that's like, that, that's the only thing that I think about when I think about collecting on other, on other platforms or other chains. And yeah. Tezos is interesting because they're in a unique spot where they're like, their whole thing was environmental friendly, you know, stuff. And then ETH's about to be that. So yeah. where do they go? And Solana kind of took a little bit. There's yeah. also wax. Uh, I have friends that make stuff on wax and oh, they yeah. enjoy that as well. Um, yeah, I think it's, to me, it doesn't matter the blockchain. There's risk of losing the art on Ethereum as well. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of unsecure images on Ethereum. Um, that's been my fear since the beginning. That's why I was so drawn to art blocks because it was on chain. Um, and even that flow drop I did is on chain flow. I mean, flow could go away, but, you know, we'll see. Uh, but, you know, I've always kind of taken the stance of if my art, disappears i have backups of all of it and i'll remint it and give it to collectors on some other manifold or something if that ever happens um you know that's only only lasts as long as me as a person or if i you know develop an estate that can do that or something um but you know that's those are long-term fears especially when i joined the space you know there was a lot of platforms that came before me that were no longer there there's a lot of lost x copy pieces that are no longer accessible that were on previous platforms before super rare. 
Um, oh, I didn't know that. So th- there's like lost, dude, this is like, it's like the lost works of Leonardo da Vinci our, yeah. in our day. It's like, there's lost X copies out there, dude. What if they there, resurface somehow? That'd be crazy. They've, there's, there's <laughs> the people that own them definitely want them to resurface. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. You should look at Art Gnome. He's got a bunch of uh, dead X copies essentially. And that's why he built this whole thing called club NFT, which is there to like save your NFTs if they go down. Um, so it, yeah, it's, it's definitely a fear and it's a reality already. And so it's just a matter of making sure as an artist, you kind of prepare for that inevitability by having backups and having a, a, an idea in place for how to solve it. Yeah, I think it's a good like differentiator for people to understand like the token is not the same as the metadata, right? So wherever that metadata is stored is is important. Uh, and then the token typically though, like you're you're definitely reliant on the chain that you're on. So yeah, Pio, you're going to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, like, you know, one thing that we talk about on the show that's like kind of a recurring theme is the idea of the traditional art market actually getting into NFTs in a, in a, serious way, right? Like not looking at an X copy differently than a Basquiat, not looking at a Fidenza differently than a Pollock, like really looking at it the same way and having an auction where they're auctioning a Rothko, but they're also auctioning a ringer, right? In the same auction. And there isn't like a, well, this one's an NFT. Like, no, it's just another piece of art. Is that a realistic future? Um, I think if you extrapolate like time long enough, that it is, but does that mean a hundred years? Does that mean five years? And, 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 you know, what are your thoughts on the future of the traditional art market fully adopting NFTs? Am I out to lunch? What, what is, you know, what, what, what are we thinking about here? I mean, my, my real assumption is that it doesn't matter um, because 20 years from now, all those rich old people will be dead and the traditional art buyers will be our peers in this space right here. Um, so in my mind, we're cultivating the traditional art buyers right now, whether they come around to it or not, doesn't matter because we're going to be here longer. Um, and to a degree, I look at how there's, there's so much effort trying to onboard traditional buyers into this space, but the way I look at it, more people on became art collectors in the past two years from NBA top shot than through Christie's or Sotheby's or, uh, Phillips or any of these things doing all this work to try and woo people over in the end we're you know that's an old way of collecting um, and we're cultivating the next wave of collectors and I, we're already starting to see it you know you're seeing like uh, Vincent van Doe or you know um, you know Cosmo Cosmo all these people they're becoming the traditional collectors using their own style of collecting and it doesn't you know to me, I uh, would love for all of that rich money to come into the space, but they're only going to go buy what people tell them to buy. And so that's all very, you know, finite in terms of where that money's going to go to, to a large degree in the same way that's always been in the traditional art world. You know, you look at, you know, people used to just send people over to France in the early 1900s and say, bring me back the best work, you know? So they're not going to actually go out and source and look and discover all this art. They're just going to buy what they're told, um, which I don't think is sustainable in the same way that onboarding millions of interested people into the space and then becoming art collectors is much better long-term plan. Yeah. They're going to buy with their, they're going to buy with their ears and not with their eyes. (laughs) Yeah. As they say. I don't know. Maybe that's, maybe that's a dire way of looking at it, but that's kind of, you know, I've, whether it's signing with like creative agencies or doing collaborations with brands, it's all about bringing more people in this space. That's the thing I regret the most about this bull run is that we had an opportunity to bring a lot of people into the space and a lot of people got brought into the space to be exit liquidity on a bunch of bullshit PFP projects that were garbage. And then they, they left and they hated the space and we missed a real opportunity to like onboard people in a genuine way where we talked about like what was good and what was bad because we were all just going crazy in that moment. Um, and I feel like we, we lost a real opportunity for growth and we're seeing that kind of play out right now. And now we're like in the rebuilding phase and now we're like, okay, yeah, maybe we, maybe we shouldn't have, uh, sold the spaces that so much. I I'm, I'm in the process of doing my taxes right now. I'm looking at stuff. I'm like, why did I pay $400 for a Bud Light next NFT? What the hell was I thinking? <laughs> oh, you didn't, you didn't know that Bud Light <laughs> would just viewed it as selling you another can of beer, just a digital one. Yeah. You didn't but realize like, think that of, Brian? Think of how many people bought that. 
and they're just like, oh, this is worth thirty dollars now. I hate NFTs, you know. So you know. Yeah, the that's... corporate side was a disaster. Uh, <laughs> I I have one more question. What yeah. uh, if you had to name three traditional artists? Uh, who you see like as the most influential to NFT artists, like when you look at NFT artists work, you know, in terms of influence, who would be the the three traditional artists that you see the most? You think? <laughs> uh, well, every, I, especially when I joined the space, there was a million Basquiat impersonators. Yep. Um, That's one of the, uh, I have a list of three that I presented on the show. That's one of them. Go I ahead. I would say Warhol in terms of marketing okay. uh, sure. and, and, and the art of celebrity. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say that that's a huge influence on the space. And then I'd say uh, Keith Haring. I yeah, think yeah. you see you know, the Vinny Hagar's and all these people that are clearly uh, Mr. Doodle. They're all lineage um, influenced by that. And just that idea of iconography and hieroglyphics you see yep. across a million different projects. And so I, in, in, in the same way that like all three of those artists were commercial artists, not pure traditional artists. Like everyone hated Keith Haring because he put up a shop in New York that you could you could buy his T-shirts for cheap. The pop uh, shop. Yeah, but like we, that is exactly what we are as a as a whole thing now, and you know, so that's why you know, again, the traditional artists were snobs about that. So why would they be cool about <laughs> essentially the same idea with this? Um, so you know, I I think if you look at those three people though, they are like the, the all-stars of the eighties. Um, and literally their, their influences are still felt and seen. Um, and I think, well, you know, you can look at Coons and Hearst and see their influence in the space as well in that sense of just commercial art. Yeah. Fan fantastic response. The only name uh, that you didn't throw in there that I expected was Picasso. Um, yeah, that's true. That's true. A lot of cubist. But the the Coons thing, that's for, yeah, like that's big time. All the 3D Instagram art uh, that came out, like those 3D PFPs, it's basically like a Coons sculpture that they turned yeah. into a PFP, you know? And I'm sure there's actual like really dope artists that have taken, I mean, Cause is like in influenced by Coons, I would think, like if you kind of look at it, I don't know, like, yeah. I, I don't know that much about sculpture, so. I would say, um, the, the artist that did the gorillas was Jamie something. He's probably a big, all those PFPs feel like gorillas. A lot of them. Um, yeah, so. they totally do. Okay. My very last question is, uh, so for those that are aspiring art collectors like myself, what would be your advice uh, for them as they enter the space? Because it can be pretty overwhelming. Uh, so what, what would you tell them as they come into the space? If they want to start collecting art, that's a question that I have started getting a lot in my DMS. And uh, I'd rather let you answer it as an artist than me. Yeah, I think that 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 falls into the two two types of people I talked about earlier: the people that sent people to go find art, or the people that uh, went to go find the art. Do you want to be someone that's an investor that's told what to buy as a safe bet? Then you go buy X copy. Do you want to be a discoverer? Then you go to foundation. You find a one of one artist you really like, and you work to grow them and build with them and you become a part of their journey. That's the fun part about the space is that collectors can have that relationship with young artists, especially uh, once they get too big, their DMS are closed and it's really hard to reach them. I totally get that. Uh, but when they're young, you can help cultivate them and give them advice and promote them. Collectors in this space make their own success by doing that. You look at the most popular collectors, they were the ones that were making threads about why their artists that they collected were important. I think you, it's it's very self-fulfilling success in this space. And it's a matter, it's a matter of how much effort you want to put into that success, or if you just want to make it as a stock investment and you just want to buy long term and known commodities. Amazing answer. I, I I hadn't really thought, I always kind of thought like, you know, the kingmakers are the ones that can do that. But like at this stage, we can all sort of become that in our own little way. So, dude, really appreciate you coming on the show today. This has been awesome. I could go on and on, but usually P.O. near the end, he starts like texting me and he's like, hey, let's wrap this. You know, we're coming up on time here, dude. So this is a blast. I just had to go one time, dude. But Brian Brinkman, ladies and gentlemen, holy shit. This was a really great was one. Awesome. Wow. Thanks for coming, man. Appreciate it. This was fun. Well, ladies and gentlemen, node mode. You, you went right. node mode today. Um, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, make sure you follow Brian on Twitter. Check out his work on Super Rare, on OpenSea, on Nifty Gateway, on anywhere else? 
uh, <laughs> No No Origin, Collabs, uh, Async Music, Genesis. P- no, I'm just kidding. There's a whole bunch. <laughs> Look them up on me Twitter, on, everyone. Follow me on Twitter. There'll be a lot of fun stuff coming out in the next week. Some, some fun surprises. Oh, damn. Nice. Oh, damn. Okay. Okay. You might want to follow. Might already, some people might already have my NFT and don't even know it right now. What? Whoa. Okay, I'm going to think about that one. You don't even know it. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for watching. This is Node Mode. Check it out on Apple Podcasts or Spotify Podcasts. Send it to any of your friends that want a blast of culture from our very own Depeche Node. Node, why don't you give us a little sign-off? Later. That's all we got for today. <laughs> <laughs>